This, dear reader, is a Monk's Diamond, which currently carries the market average price in Europe of 375 euros, or an American, 614 dollars. The reason this card is so expensive is not solely because of its power level, although it's a very powerful card in terms of accelerating a player's mana. Its cost comes from its scarcity and its demand. The amount of people that want it compared to the amount of them that are out there. The scarcity itself comes from the fact that it hasn't been reprinted kinda, in 15 years, due to a promise that the games company that makes Magic the Gathering made back in 1996. They said they would never reprint certain cards from the game's earlier days. 96 through to 2002, they added cards to that list. Except, well, they did reprint some of them. Weirdly, the rules of it are kind of hard and loose. You see, this isn't even the most desirable version of Mox Diamond. The most expensive version of Mox Diamond being this one, a foil. With a different art. What you've got to understand is that Stronghold, the set that the original Mox Diamonds were printed in, didn't have shiny cards. Instead, in 2010, Wizards of the Coast printed a small box of cards called From the Vault Relics, which included multiple cards from this list they promised never to reprint, but those cards were in foil. They're some of the greatest artifacts from throughout Magic's history, but they were shiny. From the Vault Relics sold for $34.99 at MSRP because that existed back then. Today, the Foil Diamond has a market value average of $765. If there's anything to learn from this, that you should buy every Magic product and never open it. Keep it in your cupboard. They reprinted a reserve list card and it became more expensive than the original. A testament to the fact that the reserve list is kind of nonsense. In today's video, I'm going to talk about the reserve list, the history of the reserve list, and how it's gotten less bad, that it was worse in the past. So grab a cup of tea and kick your feet up. Throw your hands in the air, maybe put the tea down first, put the tea down first. Throw your hands in the air and shout, fuck the reserve list and come with me on a journey through Magic's history. But first, a sponsored message from people who often want to talk about your balls. Listen up, you primitive screwheads. This is my beard hedger. You don't get to be the best beard in esports entertainment overnight. It takes time, effort, determination, and a narcissistic ego of a dysfunctioning man-child to obtain such a mantle. And with my beard being such an important part of my digital and physical card game entertainment persona, trimmed and honed like the lean muscles of a sexy athlete, I take my beard care very seriously. That's why today's sponsor comes in, Manscaped, the global men's lifestyle brand that's keeping my beard pristine. Now, usually in a Manscaped ad, I would have mentioned my testicles at least twice by now, which is pretty on brand for me. But in today's video, I'm talking about facial care, so I'm only going to mention my bollocks once. The beard hedger is quality and simplicity embodied. It's cordless, it's waterproof, it's rechargeable, but most impressively it features 20 different beard lengths accessible via the zoom wheel on the device, and all with just one attachment. I don't need to go digging through disorganized bathroom cabinets looking for the right beard trimmer head or attachment blade. It's all here, right at my fingertips, easy to store, easy to clean, easy to access. Genuinely, I've been using it to keep the fade on my sideburns up to scratch between barber's trips. And even better than all that, but not as good as the beard upon my chinny chin chin, is today's offer. If you hit the link in the description below, you'll get 20% off your purchase and free shipping when using my promo code. So why not pick up a beard hedger or beard hedger pro kit and refine your esports heel character look today. Thanks to Manscaped for sponsoring this video. The reserve list was a promise made by Wizards of the Coast back in 1996, where they promised to never reprint certain cards in order to maintain the faith from collectors and to a lesser extent players. In issue 10 of the Duelist magazine, a magazine about card games made exclusively by Wizards of the Coast, which sounds like a weirdly niche thing that shouldn't have existed or succeeded in any way, but bear in mind that Games Workshop were at the time making a magazine about their games exclusively, and to this day still are, and it's successful. Also remember that Wizards of the Coast were doing adverts and, and articles for Netrunner. They were trying to make a whole entire like kingdom, an entire empire of card games where it wasn't 100% dependent upon magic. But magic was the one that won. This issue even comes with an article from Mark Rosewater about insider trading. Or more accurately, it's a funny inside joke. Haha, <laughs> it's called insider trading because it's telling you about the next set. It's giving you previews, insider information to make sure you could profit upon. No, that, that's so silly. That could never happen, right? No one could profit from information that no one else has got about card games. That couldn't possibly happen. Anyway, page 90, we see this. The list of reserve list cards. A cards promised not to be reprinted ever again. Tell me why this was necessary because people were upset. Collectors who had bought in were frustrated to see reprint sets like 4th Edition and Chronicles coming out and devaluing their cards wholesale. Should I use the word wholesale there? Devaluing their cards wholesale. Lee.
Cards like Nico Bolas going from tens of bucks to just a buck. Wowza. The market was crashing. I might be downplaying it there. Some of these cards were approaching like 40 or 50 bucks at that point. I don't think in 1996 cards have broke the $100 barrier yet, but people wanted cards to be worth money in the future. I'll commentate more on that in a moment. The most interesting thing people don't talk about the initial list and the explanation of the promise is the acknowledgement by Wizards that it isn't just the collectability of the card in itself, but they must also monitor the availability of powerful and playable cards to the players. And I quote, In addition to the limited nature of our black border products, much of the collectability of magic cards is determined by its availability by gameplay purposes. Accordingly, we have decided to expand our previous policies by creating a new category of cards called reserved cards that will never be reprinted again in black and white border in game function on the identical form. This openly acknowledged that cards were desirable for their ability to be played with and that they could restrict that to keep cards expensive. Staples in the modern vernacular, cards that everyone wanted will be worth money. They would say more collectible, more desirable. I would say more money on the secondary market. On this day, reprint equity as a notion was born into the popular nerd consciousness, if not talked about explicitly or given a name for another half a decade. This idea that the collectability of a magic card is not just its scarcity, it's rare but also its playability that will come to inform the vast majority of decisions that wizards make over the next two or three decades. But was it all worth it? Was it worth doing this in the long run? We get a lot of hindsight looking back on it now. The very harsh backlash to the reprint sets at the time was a serious issue for Wizards because Magic was a smash hit by all means and a trend set that would go on to spawn an entire industry of collectible card games. It was still relatively new though and Wizards of the Coastal Collectors is highly important in keeping the game healthy long term and that meant keeping the cards desirable. There's a very real argument that Magic's long term legacy and lifespan is a direct result of this action. Think of it this way, of all the card games that came along in Magic wake, think of how many succeeded. Very, very few. And I ask you, what, what is it that Magic had that those card games didn't? Pokemon had an entire multimedia empire around it. Yu-Gi-Oh had an anime that was very much at the right time in the right place to, 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 to sort of like seep in and lay its roots. Magic arguably has the best game system, in my very biased opinion, one of the greatest games ever made, but I do think that actually having a reserve list and a good secondary market in those early days helped to keep Magic alive and strong so it can get to where it is today. I do think, although I dislike the reserve list as it stands, I think it actually did serve a purpose. It's a gold standard of sorts, a promise of value that will never be cashed in, metaphorically. So this is where we got the 1996 card reprint policy, or reserved card promise, later to be known as the reserved list promise, or simply the reserved list, that certain cards would never be reprinted in white or black border, but they did originally reserve the right to reprint them in factory sets, premium, or oversized versions. The original reserve list was to include all alpha and beta cards that were not just reprinted in fourth edition. Uh, so that meant loads of very good cards. The Power 9, for example, um, everyone's favorite Mana Rock Soul Ring. All uncommon and rare cards from Arabian Nights, Antiquities, Legends, and the Dark, not yet reprinted in the white border sets, were also included. The fact that Tabernacle wasn't considered far enough to be reprinted to Chronicles is the reason it sits on the reserve list today. And it's important to note here, part of the quote that I read is that they won't reprint them in game functional, Form. This means just changing the name and calling it a day. You can't just reprint Black Lotus, but it's wearing a hat this time and circumvent it. Importantly, this will be referred to as the spirit of the reserve list going forward. Mark Rosewater often talks about this on his Tumblr posts. He's been asked in the past why don't they just print snow duels, which is the original dual lands with snow added to them, which does make them functionally different, especially with new cards being printed in recent time, like Arkham's Astrolabe and similar, and Calderheim having snow mechanics. But ultimately, it's not a huge change. It's uh, functionally different enough in some people's eyes. But Mark Rose one, the company don't see it that way. They see that it's not in the spirit of the reserve list. Keen-eyed among you might have noticed that the list included Sol Ring, although I just realized that I added it to the script as I was recording, so you're aware of that right now. It was a powerful card in the original days of Magic, and it was not included in 4th edition because, well, by that point they realized it was fucking nuts. Sol Ring is a fascinating card in itself, uh, which is going to get a whole video, I think, soon, where I discuss its legacy. The fact that it's the poster child of EDH is actually a form of a reserve list card is kind of wild, and that is now reprinted in every single pre-constructed commander deck in spite of it actually being on the reserve list 
Alchemist at one point, and it's also super interesting in my mind. In spite of it being more powerful, I would argue, than 6 to the power 9, it's an absolutely wild story, Sol Ring. I'll talk more about it in the coming weeks, perhaps. And if you would like to see that, perhaps, hit that subscribe button, right? If you like this kind of content, smash that button and stick around for more in future. So after 1996, Sol Ring is on the reserve list along with a lot of other cards like Black Lotus, Ancestral Recall, and similar, and the list continues to grow. Part of the original promise was that they would never reprint more than 25% of the rarest cards from any given set, and that carried on until 2002. This meant that cards like Gaia's Cradle, the aforementioned Mox Diamond, and also some real stinkers too, like uh, Orem, Samite Healer, all landed up on the reserve list and still exist there today. Orem, Samite Healer, by the way, is a card that's sitting at one printing currently, but only costs you $3. I'm unsure if this just shows us that playability and uh, factors into desirability and thus cost of reserve list cards, or that Samite Healer is currently an untapped resource, and that perhaps you should try not to be left holding the hot potato by buying into all of them right now. Buy, buy, buy from CoolStiffInc.com and use the code Kenobi at checkout to get 5% off your order. In the meantime, Wizards made gold board and factory sets, non-booster products that recreated famous decks for Pro Tours. These had cradles and monoliths and all sorts of crazy shit in them, all of which were gold boarded and not tournament legal. Nowadays, as proxy-friendly EDH becomes the norm, these have started to command price tags in and of themselves, and this gold border bullshit was used most recently for Wizards to try and sell wholesale reprints of duels and tell us they're worth $1,000 for four boosters of stuff that can't be played in a motherfucking tournament. Some of these gold border duels are now selling for more than beta duels online because, and I say this partly as a joke, but partly just wandering out loud so don't hold me to it, I have no evidence, but it's just traders and vendors selling them to each other to pretend there's a market for them, like some kind of infernal demon endorsed fungible asset that makes me want to shit blood. 1999 comes around the year of partying. Macadia Mass comes out and it gives us one of the greatest lands in Magic's history, Richard and Port. Richard and Port taught many a player about resource denial on an axis that they didn't know that they didn't want until it was slapping them in the face during their upkeep. And with Richard and Port came the announcement that nothing else was landing on the reserve list. There would be no more updates to the reserve list, no more cards added. The reason I bring up Richard and Port, besides the fact that I've got it like tattooed on my arm and I love the card, is that Richard and Port is a good example of how the reserve list didn't really matter when it came to Wizards wanting to hold on to um, premium cards cardboard or desirable cards and keep their price high. It took 19 years for Richard and Port to get a reprint into a booster product. I should know, I was clambering to ask for it to be reprinted just so they could print it onto Magic the Gathering online because the cards were $200 each at one time. The thing that made me set up a Patreon was a viewer reaching out and gifting me these fucking Richard and Port to make content with when they were up to 200 bucks each. So if you're still watching it, show you daddy 69 thanks for that. I appreciate you, you kind of changed my life. It just goes to show that in spite of the reserve list, they were still willing to not reprint shit to keep it expensive. Prohibitively so. A few years passed, and in 2002, Wizards go absolutely fucking wild. On July 19th, all commons and uncommons from Alpha are removed from the reserve list. Soul Ring is unlocked, baby. As is Demonic Tutor, which I will come back to more in a moment. Demonic Tutor was an uncommon, weirdly, back in the original sets of Magic. Who would have thought that shooting for anything for two mana was worth being a rare? More testament to the fact that rarity is arbitrary. It's whatever Wizards want to make it so they can make the cards more expensive. The important note here is that they supposedly promised that they would stop amending the list. No more changes. Spoiler alert, there are more changes. Again, in the background from 98 through to 2010, we see judge foils of the reserve list stuff. A foil cradle in 98 being the most exciting, but seeing them printing a judge foil wheel of fortune as late as 2010 is pretty mad when you stop to compare it to how the trajectory of the whole thing went. These cards didn't upset collectors as much as you might think, or at least I can't find people being too mad about them. It's part of the original loophole that they end up closing in our next part of the story, where they could reprint things in foil. Imagine if they kept that open, they could print foil secret layers of dual lands. They'd make so much fucking money. But in 2010, uh, they decided not to. They pushed their luck a little bit, reprinting Diamond, Soul Ring, Frexian, Negator was a foil in a, in a, in all in various products. Negator was in a dual deck, whilst uh, Soul Ring and Diamond joined cards of Golden among others in From the Vault Relics. This did piss some people off, because these weren't just Judge foils that were quite rare, this was a relatively mass-produced product that showed up in stores. Like, I say this, From the Vault was quite a rarity, you had to like really be on good terms with this stuff only to make sure you got a copy. They also printed an almost identical version of Fork with Reverberate, except Reverberate didn't make the new copy red. Mark Rosewater later admitted that this was a mistake and something they would not do going forward. 2010, there's a final foray into revising the list to date to clear up some loose language and make the promise that the premium and non-premium version of reserve list cards can't be reprinted from now on, from 2011 onwards. I still didn't stop them printing dog shit proxy versions for $1,000 a pop from the packets, but I guess that's not premium or non-premium. That's just 
fucking shite. Demonic Tudor showed up in a few products over the years, but it took eight years since coming off the list to show up as a non-premium, a copy in the dual deck Angels vs. Demons. Demonic Tudor is a particularly impressive example of how it's now sitting at 20 printings total, not including digital versions, uh, and that includes gold bordered nonsense versions too, and the alpha copy is currently still 2,300 euros, whilst the dual deck copy will set you back 40 bucks. And as recently as 2021, we saw it printed as a lottery card with the Japanese foil version of the Strixhaven archive still sitting out I wrote it down somewhere. 300 euros. 300 euros showing that they can actually have lottery premium versions of desirable cards and still keep the old ones worth money in spite of not being on the reserve list and not not reprinting them. Let's talk about quickly about Moonvale Regent. That's right, I'm doing a Moonvale Regent side tangent. The reason is important, or at least to card market writer Christian Tobin in his article Dancing Around the Fire, circumventing the reserve list, is that he points out it's a strictly better version of Rock of Curridges. A card already on the reserve list that no one cares about. It's the same manner and it flies, which is the big point here, but it's bigger, it has a rummaging ability strapped to it, and it shoots stuff when it dies, which isn't a May ability, which means it arguably not strictly better due to the fact that if everyone had hexproof, you have to shoot yourself, but that's maybe a technicality. I think the example is just instead to show that actually they are allowed to print purely power crept versions of shit on the reserve list. They can power creep the ever loving shit out of the reserve list if they want to. We see homages to Lion's Eye Diamond and other similar reserve list cards all the time. Horizon sets are about 50% historic references to cards they can't reprint anymore. They're always functionally different, weird, and quirky. It is very rare to see an actual, factual, just better version of a reserve list card. The rock example is a weird one because it's just an old card that no one gives a shit about. But imagine a world where they can print a lotus that cracks for four mana, or maybe jewel lands that end the battle and gain new life. These might be functionally very similar similar to the originals, but they are just more powerful. They just do more. And whilst I can't imagine that being a thing they do now, it gives them room to do that in 10, 15, 20 years perhaps, when times are tough or power creep has just got to that point. And I find that interesting. It's more of a thought experiment of where they can go, more so than what they're doing right now. Now, dear listener, imagine a world where they never change the reserve list. Imagine a world in which the, your beloved Soul Ring was never taken off the list. It too was on the reserve list and got a judge foil in 2005, but eventually got another naughty foil in 2010 in the, in the Relics box that I talked about, around the time that Wizards decided to change their stance to the commons and uncommons of Alpha and Beta. In 2011, we got the Commander Precons, featuring Soul Ring using the art from the Relics, but in a non foil version, which basically sort of identified this card as the face of the format. It's the Magic the Gathering equivalent of a a five iron or something. I don't know, I don't play crochet. There are to date, if we include the known Lord of the Rings Sol Rings coming in a month or so's time, 56 fucking printings of this bastard card. In spite of this, it's still worth $1.50 for the cheapest version on most marketplaces. But imagine a world where it wasn't as ubiquitous as this in printings and in availability. Imagine a world where it was hidden away in order to push its playability to push its price tag. Well, we'd have to imagine it because that already exists even outside of the reserve list in a card called Mana Crypt. Mana Crypt is basically Soul Ring, but free. It might kill you, it does damage to you, it is a trade-off, so it's kind of trading off some, some damage for raw power, but in a format where you have 40 life, it hardly fucking matters. Mana Crypt probably should be in every commander deck, just like Soul Ring. Mana Crypt, Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, and in non-monocolored decks, Command Tower. All these things are like auto-fucking includes, and Mana Crypt is not all included in most decks simply because of its price tag. It was originally a book promo in 1995, which got a judge fall in 2011, and only got a normal boost of printing as late as Eternal Masters. It's only been in two different draft products, Eternal Masters and Double Masters, if you don't include the Masterpiece that came in Kaladesh, because that was, you know, a Masterpiece is one in every several cases, and getting a Masterpiece Crypt itself would be one in every, I don't know, 25 cases or something. So the card has only ever shown up as a lottery card, or it's been in draft packs in premium priced booster packs in master's sets, which basically just means the pack's gonna cost you 50% or 100% more if you were to buy the boosters. It was never on the reserve list, but it's a good example of this secondary list they might have of cards that keep their equity as long as you don't reprint them too much. In a weird way, it just shows us what Sol Ring would be if it was on the reserve list, or had to be limited to only foil printings. It'd probably be a lot more expensive, actually. I'm kind of glad that Wizards never did this, but in reality, maybe if Sol Ring was really expensive, everyone wouldn't depend upon it. I don't know. So I don't think Sol Ring or even Crypt are really breaking games of Commander out here in the year 2023, the, the year of our Lord and Savior, Treasures. But I do find it fascinating. Both cards are so powerful, and both cards should be included in pretty much every Commander deck, but one is and one isn't, and it's purely based upon price. And in a different timeline, that could be the same for Soul Ring. Although, although roles could be swapped, one being on the reserve list and one being able to be reprinted. I find it really interesting that like Wizards threw us a bone by giving us such a powerful artifact when they could have kept it expensive. 
I guess the argument could be made also for solving, I'm sorry, I'm talking about solving, Skull Clamp or JIT as well. Um, I don't know. I've got a whole video that I want to make on that. And here we are today. We have a reserve list, plentiful soul rings, Wizard of the Coast printing, not tournament legal proxies of the list for the express purpose of creating fungible NFTs for crypto bros and financiers to make a quick buck on. But in many ways, that's kind of in the spirit of the reserve list. It's there to appease the collectors and the people with a lot of money invested in magic. Except back in 1996, the reserve list was there to protect the game and keep it going long term. Whilst the choices being made today, Magic 30 included, aren't for that. They are to maximize profits now with no consideration of the future of the game. Weirdly, as greedy as you might think the reserve list was, it served a purpose. A purpose that you can't argue for some of the practices that Wizards are getting up to now. They're not for the good of the game or the long-term life of the game. They're to make a fuck ton of money whilst they still can. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you've enjoyed it. My name is Vince, also known as Pleasant Kenobi on the internet. I didn't catch it at the beginning. Please subscribe, like the video, comment down below, and let me know if you want to see more videos like this. And I'll see you on the next one. Oh, and click the Manscaped link as well. Helps to support the show. Ta for now.